We are so excited to have you today, sister. Uh, it's such a joy. <laughs> Thank you so much for your, uh, your accepting of this invitation. Uh, so God bless you for that. Um, so um, <clears throat> before everyone got on, uh, Sister Deanne actually greeted me in the traditional uh, Malayali Catholic way. And so could you do that again just to, to show off a little bit? Sure, Father. Wow, Iporum Iporum Studiarkete. Wow, that was amazing. Your <laughs> accent is a lot better than most American Malayali kids, to be honest. And so, congratulations for that, myself included. Um, but good. And I have another question for you. Malayaliano. Yes. Adopted Malayaliana. Wow, good. Nice. All right. So, you got a little half Malayali inside of you. So, it's very good. Love it. Good. Um, so, this is very unique, right? The CMC congregation the first uh, indigenous congregation for religious women in the Sierra Malvern Church. And you are indigenous to America, right? And so yes, the <laughs> story and how you found the CMC congregation, or at least how the CMC congregation found you and how Lord brought everything together. But we, before we dive into that, um, growing up, were you practicing Catholic? Did you have the faith? For many of us growing up here in America, for us Malayali Christians, we have very religious parents, we have family prayer, and you know, we go to church. But for you, was that the case? Did you grow up having a lot of Catholic influences? Uh, did you go to church every Sunday? Did you have family prayer? Is that something that you had in your family? So my family experience was a little bit different. I was very blessed in my family. Um, they loved me very much and helped me in so many different ways. My dad comes from an Irish Catholic family, and my family name is Love, so that comes from his side. Everyone always asks me, is that your real name? <laughs> um, so some people, even at the school, they'll call me Sister Love now. Um, my official name is Sister Diana Therese. And then my mom, she grew up in a kind of a non-denominational Christian church that closed when she was young. So then they didn't really associate with an official organized church after that. Uh, but growing up, my parents did raise us and baptize us in the Catholic Church. Uh, but our family prayer experience was much more similar to a lot of American families. So we don't have kind of the same Malayali traditions. Uh, when I talk about prayer, usually kind of our, our most solemn prayer was usually at like Christmas time or Thanksgiving or whenever we had a special occasion, we would very solemnly pray, bless us, O Lord and these thy gifts. <laughs> so that was the extent of, of the family prayer usually. Um, but going to Catholic school, I did get to know the sisters there and learned more about the prayer life along the way. Um, and my family was always very supportive in everything that I wanted to do. My singing talents are not very good at all, but I joined the kids choir um, at church because I enjoy singing at the top of my voice and very much out of tune most of the time. Uh, so when I started to go with the children's choir, then more of my family started to come along with them. I'm one of six children, so it's a big job to try to get that many kids to go to mass. Uh, but we started to go to mass more often after that. And, uh, they always encouraged me whenever I wanted to participate in different parish activities or other events along the way at the church. Great. Awesome. Um, so what number are you out of the six? I'm number three. I have two older brothers than myself, then a younger sister, and two younger brothers who are twins. <laughs> wow. Nice. A big, large family. It's awesome. What a blessing. Um, so... Was there any moment in your life in which you had like a Christ encounter or you were just always kind of this generally in this religious kind of environment or was there any moment in your retreat or maybe in college or any moment in your spiritual life that you, you know, really want to grow closer to your faith? I think for me and in a lot of ways as I was growing up, I didn't have quite that personal encounter with God. I didn't know really what personal prayer was like or um, kind of that God experience. I enjoyed the prayers at the church, like I enjoyed the mass and even the rosary when we would pray the rosary in school. I liked all of those prayers along the way. Uh, but for a lot of us growing up in the Catholic church, especially in, in the American side of things, you just know the prayers by heart and you say those prayers and you don't always reflect on them very much. So I would say it wasn't until high school when I started to go on some retreat experiences, especially at Steubenville and different encounters there, 
that I really felt that kind of more personal connection with my faith. And I would say in college as well, a lot of my faith development even came from my non-Catholic friends because they were the ones who knew how to pray more personally with God. So we would talk about prayer life together and read the Bible and have conversations in, in ways that I had never really had before when I was going to a Catholic primary school. So I would say for me, that sort of personal experience with God didn't happen until later on in my life. Wow, great. And so, yeah, it's very unique how uh, in many people's uh, faith journeys, um, people who are not Catholic, people who are Protestants, because of love for scripture and their evangelical kind of uh, ministry, brings people close to their faith in mysterious ways. So it's, it's amazing that you had that in college. Um, did you ever think about becoming a sister when you were younger? Is that something you ever dreamed about, ever, ever, ever thought about? Not at all. Not at all. I, um, it's kind of a funny story. So I would always go to church and do these different events. And there is in every church you go to, no matter what right or what country you're in, there's always the little old church ladies that will pray the rosary, pray the conda, wherever they are. And whenever I would go to church, they would always ask me, do you want to be a nun when you grow up? And my first answer was always, no, no way, never want to be a nun. I had big dreams. I wanted to like travel the world and study. I planned to work in international business and make a lot of money <laughs> and build my own house and have a big family. Like I had a big vision of my life and the dreams that I wanted to do. Um, but God was very patient with me and, and all along the way kept on calling me and drawing me to himself. And I would say the seeds were there from the very beginning of my life. I was just very resistant to them. Uh, the school I went to had Franciscan sisters of St. Joseph. They were some of my first teachers in school. And now I, I always credit them with planting the first seeds of my vocation back in those earliest days, just in the way that they would live their life and, and really care for all of the students and help my family and help me and give a good witness with their lives. But I never thought of following them <laughs> or becoming a sister until later on. I, I would say really probably at that same time that high school and college going on retreat, experiencing prayer as I started to reach out to God, then that's the time I could hear that he was calling me to something else. And I felt that kind of pull at my heart in a deep way for the first time. Great. Awesome. That's beautiful. And you went to college after high school, right? Um, and so yes. what did you study in college? I, I was an overachiever um, in academics for quite most of my life. So in high school, I took all, you know, the advanced placement classes and everything along the way. So I started college with the, the status of a junior in terms of credits. Then I did a triple major and I studied English, Spanish and accounting. Uh, because I had those plans to work in international business along the way. So that was um, my undergraduate studies. Then after I finished my bachelor's degree, I got an opportunity to work with the AmeriCorps VISTA program, which is a service program at an outreach library in Minnesota. So working with a lot of, of students and refugee and immigrant families and helping to provide services for them. Then I got another grant working in Argentina teaching English with the Fulbright program. And I fell in love with teaching. I also never thought I would be a teacher in my life, um, but I fell in love with teaching. And then when I came back to the US, I got my master's degree in teaching after that. That's great. I mean, I guess you're, you're now in the international business of uh, saving souls. I guess the Lord has a little twist. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Spanish, and I believe you teach Spanish, correct? At, at, a, at a local high school now? Yes, yes, I teach Spanish now. Oh, that's great. Have you taught any of the sisters that you live with any Spanish? Do you guys do any prayers, any Hail Marys? We, we've been working on it. Uh, this last Saturday, I was just saying uh, the first decade of the rosary. Normally, I go back and forth when it's uh, our community together. Usually, I say that first decade in Malayalam. Uh, but on Saturdays, I've started to say in Spanish because the sisters want to learn how to say at least the Hail Mary in Spanish. But I think I have to... Um, even though Spanish is written in English letters, the same alphabet, unlike Malayalam, which is very confusing, mm -hmm. and the pronunciation is different. So I was thinking uh, one of these days, I'm gonna sit down and write like the Hail Mary in Spanish, but write it in Malayalam letters so the sisters oh. can read more easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wonder what in the, 
spalialum. I don't know what you would call that. Or <laughs> it's, spalialum, I like it. Um, um, and so you did mention before that, um, you know, growing up, your dream was to do international business and, and have a large family. And um, many girls discerning, um, naturally, uh, they want to be a biological mother, right? You know, I, very hard to find a young woman who is repulsed when seeing a child. No, naturally, you know, women love seeing babies and, you know, dream about being a mother themselves. And so for you, um, how do you reconcile that? How did you like deal with that natural desire to want to be a mother? Uh, but at the same time, you are now, I guess, sacrificing biological motherhood for a different type of motherhood, spiritual motherhood. So could you talk about that discernment and how you kind of had to make that decision and how, I guess, maybe it was difficult, maybe it was easy for you, I don't know. That's a very good question. And I think really what you mentioned about spiritual motherhood is the key to that discernment as well. And partly I would reassure anyone discerning that it's good to have that desire to have children. You should have that desire. That's part of our, our makeup as women, uh, that God gives us that mother's heart. So I think in religious life, we just have to understand how to transform that desire from being limited just to a biological family to really encompassing so many other people. Uh, my students will sometimes ask me like, didn't you ever want to have kids? And I tease them sometimes. I'm like, I feel like some days I have 600 of my own children. <laughs> uh, because you get that relationship and that connection with the students that you work with, the people that you encounter and everyone along the way. So I don't feel like I'm lacking anything. Um, although when I was growing up, I, I always used to joke around and say I would keep my last name because my, my last name is Love. I said if I got married, I'd keep my last name and I would name my first girl Faith Hope. So her name would be <laughs> Faith Hope Love. <laughs> So I think God was even planting a seed there that instead of a literal faith, hope, and love, that I should nurture like those virtues in my own soul and then spread them in the life around me and the work that I do. And um, I feel very, very fulfilled in that sense. Like the sisters that I have, the connections with the, the Malayali uh, community, and especially our Syro Malabar priests and seminarians, like brothers and fathers and aunties and uncles and <laughs> chechis, <laughs> like so many things along the way that you feel that connection to your family as well. That's great. That's good. I'm glad you, uh, you know, you fit right in. You know, I've seen you for the past few years and so it's such a blessing to have you among us. Um, speaking about love, I can't really ask these to our Manali sisters, but have you ever dated before? Have you ever have a boyfriend or anything? I, I did date some along the way, which is a little bit different too in, in the American culture compared to the Indian culture as well, especially with like the roles between men and women and the very formal distance and the kind of arranged marriage and arranged courtship and arranged dating and a little different experience. Even here in the U.S. with Malayali families, like when we go to the Ciro Malabar conventions, there's like the app, the Ciro Match app, so the parents can help find. I this Someone had to explain that to me when we went to convention. I'm like, what is Ciro Match? So <laughs> um, for me, I, I didn't date very much when I was younger because I was very focused on the, the academic of everything I, I was studying and trying to get ahead in school so I didn't do much until college then all my friends were like why don't you go out on some dates and see some guys and um so I did a, a little bit along the way but I never had uh, I guess like a, a steady boyfriend because I was traveling and studying and doing other experiences but I think that's also a, a normal part of development for a girl as well. Like you should think about that romantic relationship and, and discern and see where is, uh, where is God calling us to go. Great. Awesome. Uh, well, the Lord has led you here. Um, there is no more other guy in your life except our Lord Jesus Christ. So praise God for that. Um, and the so, best guy ever. Amen. I mean, I wish you can just tell it to a lot of our uh, ladies who are looking for this magic guy to fall from the sky. He's not going to come. If you're waiting for him, it's Jesus Christ. No. 
<laughs> and that's one of the things too. I, I, I think that's also something we can share. Like just as with that motherhood, like God will fill your heart with those spiritual motherhood feelings. And also even those romantic feelings, like when you really have that relationship with Jesus and you have that deep prayer life, which is hard sometimes in the busyness of life. But when you have that quiet time and you can talk with like your Jesus one on one, he'll fill your heart with that love. So you don't feel that lack either because no human man knows you so deeply and can give you everything. Like my Jesus spoils me to death. <laughs> he, he answers all of my prayers and gives me everything that I need and takes care of me so much. So I feel that, that love. <laughs> wow. That's beautiful. What a beautiful witness. Um, and so you mentioned that it was in college that you were getting more into your faith and, you know, becoming, asking yourself these deeper questions and feeling the call. And so how did you make that decision? Because you are a very bright person, triple major, that's really tough. I mean, I'm sure the world was very uh, tempting to, you know, have a nice house, as you mentioned, and to, to make a lot of money and traveling the world. Um, but how did you, or when did you start feeling the call to be a sister? When did that start to happen? And, and how did you know it was a call from God? Yeah, so that's a good question, too. I would say for me, it, it was a journey that took some time. Um, so those, those first call experiences started as I was developing that relationship with God. But then I tend to procrastinate on a lot of things in my life. Uh, and really, God works in his own time with each of us. So after um, college, I traveled and worked, and then I went back and studied my master's. And then I worked for a few more years in different high schools in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. I taught English and Spanish and theology and campus ministry along the way. And I traveled more. That, that's the beautiful thing about God. He gave me even that dream I had to travel at the beginning. He fulfilled that as well. So I went like to World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil with Pope Francis and uh, a missionary trip. We traveled to see the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico along the way. And we volunteered at an orphanage in Peru as all part of that World Youth Day experience. And then I went on a mission trip in Cameroon, Africa. So God took me place to place and experience to experience so I could see more of the world and what was out there and the challenges of people and what they faced. And I would kind of go from one school to another looking to serve like I wanted to serve communities more in need. I wanted to work with populations that spoke more Spanish. So I went from place to place and I was very successful in, in the work that I was doing. Um, but I would say what happened all along the way was a feeling of restlessness in my heart. So no matter where I went or what I studied or how much I traveled or how well I was doing in my career, there was still something in my heart that was empty in, in a way. There, there wasn't a satisfaction in what I was doing. And I was wondering, like, I did so many things. I got a good education. I was working a good job. I traveled. All those dreams I had laid out, not so much money. Teachers don't make a lot of money, but I made enough to have a comfortable living. So all of those things God had given me, but I still wasn't happy and I didn't know why. So I kept on going back to that question. Every time I changed jobs, I would think about like religious life too. I still remember it was back in high school, I believe I, I filled out for the first time that like vision vocation match survey that you can do online. And you can see the different religious orders and congregations out there. So I would get emails and mailings and things. And, and I knew a lot of sisters. I grew up with Franciscans. I worked with Dominicans at a school. I knew the Sisters of Life. So many sisters I met when I traveled. Uh, sisters from congregations that speak Spanish and English and other languages. But nothing felt quite right. So I was kind of left in a state of confusion, we could say, because I knew what I was doing in the world wasn't satisfying me but I didn't know where to go if religious life was what I was supposed to do. It, it's kind of like going to one of those old fashioned ice cream shops where you have all of the flavors laid out in front of you. And like, how do you know which one fits for you? And, and every one that I saw, even when I thought it would be a good fit, when I went more to like a prayer experience with them, it just didn't match me. And I, I couldn't imagine being happy with that group. So I was kind of uh, at a loss what to do. And I told God, if you want me to be a sister, then you're going to have to bring the sisters to me because I don't know where to go. Then very providentially, our CMC sisters moved into my own parish 
And the convent there, where I had grown up, our, our family home, is only two and a half blocks away from the church and the school I went to growing up. So I would walk back and forth to school and church from home. And our CMC sisters moved in right where the Franciscan sisters used to be before they got a little more elderly and had to move away. Um, and they came to know that I was discerning a religious vocation because the pastor was my spiritual director as well. So I think he whispered a little bit in Sister Linda's ear and let her know, like, maybe talk to this American girl and see if she even likes religious life at all. Uh, so I started to get to know the sisters and join them for prayer experiences. And I fell in love. I fell in love with this strange, mysterious Malayalam Syro rite liturgy and Indian culture that I had never heard of before in my life. <laughs> but it was really what God was calling me to. And I felt that peace, oh, that deep peace in my heart from the first moment, praying with the sisters and, and being with them. And I was so happy. And that, that happiness is what drew me back and back to the community and to meet them more and learn more about them. That's awesome. Yeah, you mentioned that that deep restlessness that we all have in our hearts, and it echoes, you know, Saint Augustine, who who has that beautiful prayer: "You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you." And that restlessness can only be satisfied by our Lord, and that's the peace that you encountered, and that deep longing peace that the world can't give, but only our Lord can give. That is what you experienced, and that's what I experienced also when I went to visit the seminary too. And so, for those who are discerning peace that deep longing peace that's that only our lord can give that is the way in which our lord like shows us where he wants us to be so it's that's really beautiful um did you ever think that you know so you had visited other congregations did you do any come and see retreats did you spend time with them or it was just more just very basic just visiting and then that's it i didn't do anything official come and see per se um, what I would say is I had more through work, especially like I worked at a Dominican high school uh, in one of my jobs and we went on a conference sponsored by the Dominican sisters of St. Cecilia. So we went out there and we got to, to see the sisters and meet them and visit their mother house and we went to their retreat house for a day. So that was from like kind of the professional side of things. And then similarly, when I was working in Argentina, I met uh, Franciscan missionary sisters there. And I was a volunteer as an animator in their youth movement that's called Piedras Vivas, which means living stones. So I worked with the youth and got to know the sister there. They have one sister, Sister Mariana. She plays the guitar. Uh, and I got to see her final per profession, her perpetual vows. We all went to see uh, when she made her final vows in Argentina. And then they also had in that same city where I was working, another group called uh, the Little Servants of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which is a very long name in Spanish when you say it in Spanish. And they had a formation house there. So I was teaching at the college level at the time. So some of their formees were going to college there and studying at the teacher training school. So I got to go and visit their formation house for a day and it's really kind of amazing to me uh, that I had so many experiences, even though it wasn't official come and see, like God really showed me like the inner workings of a lot of congregations. Like how often do you go to a mother house or a formation house just randomly when you're working somewhere else or traveling along the way? So um, it's kind of strange how God arranges all of those things. That's, yeah, everything has its own place, its own time, and its own reason. It's really beautiful when we, we see God's providence unraveling in time. Um, and so when you first thought about, um, you know, visiting the CMC sisters who are, that's amazing, they were only two and a half blocks away from your house. Wow, what a blessing. Um, at least for me, when I started discerning with the Sierra Malabar Diocese, I, I asked myself, could I be a Sierra Malabar priest? I can't read or write Malayalam. What am I going to do? I can't even say the word Malayalam properly. And so uh, what am I What am I going to do? But then at the same time, did you ever think that, well, you are not Indian? You don't know Malayalam, at least back then. You didn't know anything now. You know probably more than I do. But um, back then, did you ever think, would it be possible? Am I allowed to? Is this something that could happen? Um, what were your thoughts about that and that whole cultural kind of difference of joining a congregation, which is a majority of, of Indian sisters? It was definitely something that I had to discern through 
very carefully, I would say, kind of thinking about that cultural adjustment and if I would, would be happy long term, because that was one of those things I said, like I was very happy and peaceful in the beginning and I had that doubt. I'm like, will this continue? Will, will I still be happy or will it be too difficult? Like the cultural adjustments and figuring out even different body language, like the Malayali yes, which is kind of like this, <laughs> which <laughs> is very different than the American yes and the American no. So I was like, are you telling me yes or no? And you kind of shake your head like that. <laughs> so just those small adjustments along the way took some getting used to. But I would say for me, that's one of the benefits of really kind of discerning a con like a, a vocation and joining a congregation when you're a little bit older because God had showed me so many different parts of the world and other cultures and learning Spanish pushed me past my boundaries and comfort zone as well. So I had had that experience of immersion in another culture and another language. Um, so God showed me like, you, you can do this if, if you're open to it. And if the sisters are open to it, and we didn't know any of the permissions that we had to do even at the beginning, because I was the first American one, and, and not even an American Malayali girl, but like a, a white gringa, you would say, in, in Spanish uh, American. So like, what do we do with this white girl as well when she comes uh, to the Ciro Malabar Cathedral? I, I didn't even know what Latin rite was when I first joined. I still remember the first time the sisters took me to the cathedral to speak with the youth there. And one of the, the young uh, teenagers, he asked me, are you Latin? And I thought he was confused and was asking if I was like Latina or something. Like, do I look Latina? <laughs> I didn't know Latin right was a thing in the church. I didn't know Ciro Malabar right or anything. And I would say that's part of why our, our formation process is, it takes time. It, it takes years of formation to go through. So from that first moments of entering and not knowing any of the language or the culture or the food, even just getting used to the food takes time as well, that God slowly walked me through all of that process so that I could get more comfortable and fall in love with my Malayali community and my Indian sisters and realize that although our language might be different and our appearance and the culinary habits and some of those things, like they're all surface. But underneath it, it's that deep love of Jesus and, and that Carmelite spirituality and our identity as religious sisters. That's really what matters uh, beyond any of those outside differences. That's amazing. That's really beautiful that you mentioned how at the depths of everything, it's that a love of Christ that unites you and your sisters together. Uh, when, when Bishop did send me to, to India for seminary, uh, of course, that's a very big cultural gap for me as well. And, you know, of course, I could have just, you know, spent the entire time comparing American culture and Indian culture and, and all that stuff and just saying, oh, and in, in America, we have this, in America, we have that. But I decided, you know what, let me just dive into this. And being with the brothers and living in a seminary, it was actually, perhaps I would say, my favorite part of seminary formation. Uh, more than New York, more than Chicago, more than Rome, I loved my time in Kerala. Uh, just because, as you mentioned, it was that love of Christ that really united us and was able to to go beyond those uh, linguistic cultural borders and barriers. Uh, great. So you mentioned that um, formation takes many years, right? Um, and so what is the process like? So you visited the sisters um, and you are from the Latin rite. Now you know what the Latin rite is. Um, and so yes. <laughs> what was the process of joining them? Was there an application? Um, was there a come and see retreat? Um, and then what are the different phases of formation and what are you in now? Yes, so um, kind of that initial process was a little more informal for us because we didn't have the structure necessarily set up at the beginning. I would say I, I got to know the sisters for about a year. Um, I got to know first our sister Celine Rose, who was a catechist in the same parish where I was. So she was the first CMC sister that I met. Uh, she's working with our sisters in Canada right now and the mission there. So she was the first one I would kind of talk to about that prayer life and getting to know the sisters along the way. And then they started to invite me to more experiences. So we celebrated Christmas with Mar Jacob Angadiath. He came and we said the Siro Malabar Namaskaram in Malayalam, they recited. I had no idea what it was, but it was so beautiful that Christmas night, like hearing the chanting of the prayers in Malayalam. I enjoyed that very much. Um, and I went to the cathedral and, and participated in Kurbana and some experiences there. Uh, so that I would say kind of getting to know process took us around a year or so. 
And then uh, one of the turning points was really when I went to Canada with the sisters to open our community there. So they invited me to come along with, and I must tell you, if you want like a deep experience of prayer in your life, you can take an 18 hour uh, car ride with a bunch of nuns and a couple of priests along the way <laughs> and stop at a few places. And I got to meet the, the bishop <laughs> and so many experiences during that time. And one of the key things was that the sisters shared their vocation stories and they told what drew them to the convent and their experiences. And I still remember on the way back, uh, Sister Linda asked me now, did, did Deanna share her experience? And I was like, I have no vocation story to tell you. And she's like, no, just tell the story of your faith journey, your relationship with Jesus, with God throughout your life. Now I'm a teacher, so I like to talk a long time. And I had never told the whole story of my life before at one sitting. But when you drive from another country, you've got more than enough time to talk for a while. Uh, so I told the whole story of, of my life and kind of that relationship with God and the work that I was doing. And that was really the first time I could put my finger on that feeling of restlessness, that that's what was bothering me throughout the last years of my life. And I talked about kind of that discernment process and wondering if God was calling me to religious life, but not knowing where to go. Then Sister Linda, I think prompted by the Holy Spirit said, well, if you want to, why don't you just come and stay with us and see if you even like religious life? So I told her I would think about it and, and that I would pray and uh, talk with my family and, and see what we might want to do along the way. Uh, then I went home and I did a little bit more of a prayer experience. I went that weekend on a walking pilgrimage that the Archdiocese of Milwaukee was organizing through their vocation promotion ministry with the young adult ministry in Milwaukee. We went on a walking pilgrimage from the seminary in Milwaukee all the way to Holy Hill uh, in how, the how northern many, part of Wisconsin. Is that, way? How many miles is a pilgrimage? That was like, I think 43 miles or so we walked along the way. It took us four or five days to do. Oh. I'd never walked so much in my life. <laughs> um, but that gave me the time really to reflect on that call. And, and it's during that time I decided that, that I would go and, and move into the convent. And I called a meeting with my parents and told them I have to talk to you about something. Then my mom is very wise. I, I'm very blessed in my mother. We, we've always spoken more about that, that kind of spiritual side of things and prayer life. So, so I called the meeting. This is our formal American culture kind of in a way coming to play. And I sat down and the first thing my mom said was, you're not joining the convent, are you? <laughs> so she knew already that that's where God was calling me. I can be a little bit blind sometimes in my own life, but the people around me love me and, and they know where God is calling me even before I do. Uh, so I said, yes, I, I wanna join the convent. And um, they were very supportive and, and I moved in shortly thereafter. The sisters were like, we kind of have to call and figure out how to do this too, because that was the first time that we had accepted a candidate from America. So we had to call and make the arrangements, but all of the superiors were very open to it. Um, and I think that's also, again, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Like otherwise, who else would say, sure, let the random American girl join the Malayali congregation who never knew a thing before about. Uh, but God will put the, the right people in leadership, I think at the right time to make those good decisions, to, to pave the path forward. And I would say even with the timing that our sisters came to the convent and setting that up, it, it all worked out so I could have that experience and God could bring me where he wanted me to go. Not, not where I was planning to go necessarily. Nothing I could have imagined would have brought me to CMC. It was only God that could have called me and brought me here and, and kept me here this long and kept me so happy. Um, so that was kind of what led to my entrance in the convent. Then in terms of the formation process, back, back to the practical point of your question. So you start as a candidate. And for me, we did that candidacy in a few months period because I already had all my education. In India, a lot of times we have girls will join the convent when they still have to do their plus two or their upper studies, um, whether it's in secondary study or another area. So that candidacy might take a little longer for them. So we did that in a few months time. And then uh, we did what's called aspirancy. And some congregations will have different names for these kind of stages of formation. So that was all together one year, that kind of initial first year of formation. Then after that, I did postulancy. 
And that was where I got another kind of special dress along the way, the official religious dress. And that after the year of postulancy is two years of novitiate. And the first year of novitiate is called a uh, canonical novitiate. And that's when I stopped working. So up until that time, I was doing my religious formation and working and finishing my master's degree along the way as well. So it's with novitiate that then I stop work by, by canon law, that's what they want you to do. So you can really discern religious life and see if this is really where God is calling you to. And that was a time of, of deep prayer and deep formation. Uh, and that's when I moved to our community here in Oak Lawn, which is nearer to our Chicago Cyril Malabar Cathedral. Before that, I did the first two years of my formation in Wisconsin. Then the second year of novitiate is the more practical side of things. So I had a Regency experience in our convent in Louisiana. I belong to Bhopal province. I'm very proud to belong to Bhopal. Uh, and we have our community in Louisiana belongs to that same province. We're a mission province. Um, that, and the sisters speak English. So that's part of why we, we chose that province for me. And also because we have a convent here in the US as well with our sisters there. And then I did another Regency experience in Canada. And then kind of the key of that whole second year of novitiate formation was the time I spent in India. And it was such a blessing. God brought me there and arranged everything. I went in November of 2019 last year and then came back in February. So right before all of the COVID pandemic kind of came through and God brought me there in the right time and brought me back in the right time as well. But I would agree with you and say like, Probably the favorite part of my experience in formation was being in India where I could see where our congregation came to life and I could do formation with the other novices who were also in that same stage and getting ready uh, to make their profession of vows. So then I came back. So that brings us to about four years. So that initial stage that could be between four and six years, depending on how long you take in those first two stages of formation. Then I made my first profession of vows and vestition. Uh, vestition is the name for receiving the habit. Uh, with the wonderful help of our Kevin, uh, <laughs> Father Kevin, who was our commentator during that very long ceremony in the Cyril Malabar Cathedral. And Father Kevin did such a beautiful job. I, I joked around and said he had to say more than even I did in the whole ceremony of everything. It, explaining all of the symbolism and the meaning of all of it. So I made my first profession of vows in August, on August 16th, just a few months ago, two months and two days ago now. Um, so that's why I have a white veil. You'll see all of our other CMC sisters in the US, they wear a black veil because they've made their perpetual profession. So you're under temporary vows for between five to nine years. So the first profession is for one year, and after that one year, then you renew those vows of chastity, obedience, and poverty. And that allows, again, for that deeper discernment, like really, is this the life for me? And for the congregation to see as well, is the sister going to be successful in this life with this congregation living out this charism? So the church really gives you that time to confirm your commitment to religious life and to your particular congregation. So there's no doubt along the way, you know, whether or not you should continue there. There's always that openness to discerning where God is calling you and that time to, to make a real commitment. Interesting. So I guess you're still discerning if God is calling you to be a sister, like you could leave. Is that something that is allowed? Is that something that you can do during your temporary vows? It, it is allowed and permitted by the church. But I would say for me and, and for most of the sisters, when we make that first profession, we always consider that like our perpetual profession, because by the time you get to that point, like you're giving yourself completely to Jesus, completely to the work, completely to the congregation and where God is calling you. Uh, but the church does allow for that. If someone discerns that this life is really not for them, you can leave during that temporary vows. You would just wait for that time of the vows to expire and, and you would write, like there's a whole process for it in the church to allow for this. So you would write to the superiors in the congregation and explain like, after this time, I just don't feel that this is necessarily the right fit for me for these reasons. Like what is it that that is seeming to be uh, an obstacle to continuing in religious life? And then you can have that conversation too and see like, are these really valid reasons or is there something else 
that we can do to help in this situation? Is there some kind of, you know, cultural misunderstanding? Is there some other kind of difficulty? Is there a problem in the family? Is the family going through a difficult time? And, and that makes it difficult for the junior sister to go through as well. So there can be that open conversation. But as, as I always tell the girls uh, who might be discerning religious life, you're not in prison. <laughs> there, there's no handcuffs or anything. So at any time, like, if you ever feel that God is not calling you to this life, you can always go. Like, there's nothing keeping you here except your own will and, and your own love of God and that call in your heart. It's beautiful. It's a great, uh, great image. You're not in prison. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. So <clears throat> you're a CMC sister of the Carmelites of Mount Carmel or Mother Carmel? We're the congregation of the Mother of Carmel. I should have known that I did the commentary, so... <laughs> no problem, Father. <laughs> um, could you explain what Carmelite spirituality is? Because October is a great month because we have two great feasts for Carmelite saints, St. Therese of Lisieux, whom you took the name after. And we also have, we also have St. Therese of Avila, right? We celebrate a couple days ago. And so both are Carmelite saints and Carmelite spirituality is a big part of Catholic spirituality as well. And so could you explain in a nutshell what exactly is Carmelite spirituality? Yes, and I'm so happy we're doing this talk in the month of October because it's such a blessed month for Carmelites and two of my favorite Carmelite saints. So I took my name after St. Therese of Lisieux. Uh, she's my particular patron saint. And I love the pairing of Therese of Lisieux and of St. Therese of Avila, we have Cochu Tresia, Nama Tresia. Someone just asked me during a, a professional development meeting for school, if you could have lunch with any person living or deceased, who would it be and why? And I told them, I'm like, I know the question says one person, but I would choose to have lunch with St. Therese of Lisieux and St. Teresa of Avila, because I would love to hear them talk with each other and see their understanding of that Carmelite spirituality. Uh, so I would say in, in a nutshell, really that Carmelite spirituality comes down to a lot of the prayer life and that experience of the interior encounter of the soul with God. In our CMC constitutions, it says, there is no Carmel without prayer, and there is no prayer without silence and solitude. So though silence and solitude are deep pillars of our Carmelite spirituality, and especially that devotion to our Blessed Mother, um, under the, the name of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, she gave the scapular to St. Simon Stock as a sign of her protection for the whole Carmelite order. So you have that deep prayer life. You have the devotion to our Blessed Mother. We're a very Eucharistic spirituality as well. So praying before the Blessed Sacrament, whether it's in your meditation time or in times of adoration is very important for us. And we're also influenced by the Carmelite spirituality by St. Chavra as he's our founder. We have St. Coriacos Elias Chavra and Father Leopold Beccaro are the founders of our congregation in 1866 in India. So when we talk about St. Chavra's Carmelite spirituality as well, he has that kind of Abba experience with God. So that's another unique layer to our particularly uh, Cyril Malabar side of the Carmelite spirituality. So you have kind of all of the layerings of these influences there. But I would say really that that deep prayer life, that silence and solitude, the devotion to Blessed Mother and the Eucharist, that's, that's the heart of all Carmelite spirituality. And it's expressed in different ways. St. Teresa of Avila reformed the whole Carmelite order and established monasteries and wrote great theological works about prayer life. And then you have St. Teresa of Lisieux lived a very quiet life, very unknown life in a tiny cloistered convent in France, and no one knew who she was in her life. But she wrote so powerfully about that experience of God's love and her little way of living out that love that she inspired so many people and became the patron saint in conjunction with St. Francis Xavier of all missions and missionaries. So you've got a, a, a lot of uh, richness in all of our Carmelite saints. That's, that's beautiful. What a great spiritual tradition. What a great treasure chest of, of different devotions and saints. Wow, what a blessing. Um, and so. Um, if someone wanted to learn more about becoming a CMC sister in America, uh, what would that look like? Who would they contact? Is there any person maybe in charge of locations um, that you can get someone in touch with? 
I would say probably Sister Linda would be a good starting point uh, as she's working now at our Zero Malabar Cathedral. So she can put in the chat as well any contact information along the way. We're, we're trying to do more vocation promotions and in conjunction with you as well and other sisters in the area to help like girls who might be discerning uh, where God is calling them in life. But I would say if you know any CMC sisters, any sister you can speak with and say, you know, I'm thinking about religious life or I'm wondering what to do or how do you even know if you have a call or even before that, how do you pray? I, I would say that is one of the first steps, like starting the prayer life first and the sacramental life. Then God will speak to you in those times and start to call you and then how do you respond to that call? Um, and we are working, I know, on updating the website and all of those technical side of things along the way. Uh, so there's always the ability to, to speak with any of us and reach out to us with any questions. And all of the lovely Achins in our Cyril Malabar Church as well have our contact information. So if you don't have a sister in your own community or you're not sure how to get in touch with one, you, you can talk with your, your Achin at your local church too, and he can help to get you in touch with us. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, you also have a unique uh, Kurbana book, correct? Um, <laughs> yes. Participated in Malayalam Kurbana. And you can't, well, actually, you, you are learning Malayalam. You've been learning Malayalam for a couple of years, right? I know some of the sisters have been teaching. Yes. I know that if you ever go into the Oak Lawn uh, convent, there's a little board there, which usually has a little, at least whenever I go, it's a feast day. And so Sister Deanna will write some Malayalam actually on the board, on the dry erase board. So that's really cool. Um, do you have your book on you by any chance? Could you show us um, how you participate in the Malayalam Gurbana? Sure. I did bring my Kurbana Pustagam with me, so I have my own copy of the, the Kurbana book. And, you know, the sisters are very patient with me because Malayalam, when you try to learn, there's so many letters compared to English. So I still remember my first lesson, letting, uh, sitting down to learn the vowels. And I'm like, oh, this will be pretty straightforward. You know, English, A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y. Sit down with Malayalam. It's like, okay, ah, ah, E, E, O, Oh, and I'm like, why are there two of every vowel? <laughs> then there's the symbols. And so I learned the vowels, then I learned the consonants. <laughs> then I'm like, okay, I can make words. You just put the consonant, like I can put ka together with the vowel that you write out for o and make ko. And the answer is no, you cannot do that. You have to learn more symbols that connect, you know, that sound of the vowel with the particular consonant. Um, but I really enjoy it along the way. And I learned how to write out like the Munglish transcription as well. Uh, so I'm able to participate as we go through and I can say some of the prayers. Uh, let me open up one page. And I can show you the songbook too. That might be easier to see on the webcam. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so this is like one more. Then I would write the transliteration so I can pray along with the people as we go through and do the prayers and the singing. And I did with a lot of the songs as well. We have like songs for um, St. Chavra and songs for Blessed Mother that are in Malayalam. Uh, so like this was one from like the Mount Carmel one. So this book I do in three colors. So I have one color with the Malayalam and then one color with the English translation and then one color with the Munglish transliteration. So that I can go through and sing along with as well as we do <laughs> the wow. Kurvana celebration. But for me, I like that because that active participation really makes me feel like I'm praying throughout the whole Kurvana and being able to, to say the responses. And it's so beautiful, the liturgy, to, to see the meaning and the significance of all of it. I would say learning about that Cyril Malabar liturgy helped me to appreciate even the Latin Rite liturgy more. And I was able to go to a Cyril Malankara service as well a couple of times during formation and see what's different about their rite and their liturgical practices and see the beauty of our Catholic Church and all of its variety. It's amazing, yeah. I mean, that's made the, the amount of dedication you put into translating that and to writing the transliteration. It's really, really beautiful. So congratulations to you for doing that. Uh, you're a great way. You should congratulate all of my sisters who spent countless hours. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I realized with me. that. Because uh, when, when Bishop had told me to learn the Malayalam Gurbana uh, before ordination, um, 
you know, it's hard to find someone who's patient enough to sit down with you to go over all those prayers, right? Everyone knows Malayalam, but whether they want to spend five hours trying to learn one prayer, that's a different story. So thank you all, dear sisters who sat down with Sister Dan to teach her. If you have more time, you want to teach me. Also, we do something through Zoom, we can set that up also. Um, but before we close, what, what's some advice you would just give to a young girl? So actually, I saw a statistic recently, very surprising. Uh, but in America, right, there have been decades of dwindling numbers for sisters. But recently, there have been such a growth in number of sisters to the point where the average age of an American sister is 24. I don't know if you saw that statistic, but that was, that was completely amazing. I was like, whoa, that, that, I had no idea that there were that many uh, sisters uh, joining the convent from America. And so uh, what advice would you have? I feel, I personally feel there's a springtime in our church that our Lord is calling, but I feel many times it's hard. A lot of different things, different sounds of the world, different voices. What, what advice would you give to a young girl who is open and trying to see if, is God calling me to this? I think it really is a beautiful time in our church because we have that voice of God calling so many people and inviting them to join the church and to help, whether it's as a priest or as a religious sister. And I would say my, my first advice is to make time for that silence and that prayer because our world is filled with so much noise, especially with our technology. We have the phones and the social media and all of the things going on and all of the messages that we hear that it can be hard sometimes to hear God's voice in the midst of all of that. So I would say that would be my first kind of advice is to make that time for silence and for prayer in your life and just to sit and ask God, like, is this what you're calling me to? Like, what do you want me to do with my life? How do you see your life and your vision and your plan? And then I would say the sacramental life is a very big step. So go as often as you can to Holy Kurbana, don't go to confession, like don't wait, uh, go as often as you can. I, I would really say in my life, I saw a big experience of God's graces. When I started to go, to go to confession each week and when I started to go to daily mass and experiencing the sacraments and God in my life in a very powerful way. And then I would say, reach out and, and talk to a religious sister or a priest and just start to have that spiritual direction along the way with a trusted adult that you can open up to and say this is something that you're thinking about and um, how they would direct you and where they would encourage you to turn. So that would be another key is having someone to speak with and to share the journey with along the way helps a lot because it takes time. It, it's not for some people, it can happen very quickly. But for most, the discernment is a long experience and you go from one to another and you develop and you grow in that call and then eventually God will show you where he's calling you. So the prayer life, the sacramental life, and the spiritual direction would be very important. And just enjoy that experience. I, I would say it's kind of like a courtship in a way where Jesus will call you to himself in all kinds of ways that you don't even understand until later in your life, all of those experiences and those blessings that God sends to you. So it's a very beautiful time, that discernment as well. It can be confusing because you don't know where to go. Uh, but it's an experience of God's grace and mercy in a very powerful way, too. It's like falling in love. Wow. Just like your last name. Beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> great, great, great way to, to close that and end that. Thank you so much, sister. So um, we have reached almost an hour, so I'm sure you must be very tired of talking for all this time. Um, but if anyone has any questions, you can message, send a private message to me and then we will see if anyone wants to or we can see if sister will answer these questions uh, we do have some um, one person did ask could you start a spanish online class <laughs> <laughs> spanish and malayalam classes along the way it's very good to have those language skills and and if you do have any questions i'm i'm free now to to answer anything so i'm very happy to to respond to any questions you might have so one of the first words I learned in Malayalam as we were going through um, is actually the word mesha, 
for table because the word in Spanish for table is mesa. So there's that similar influence there with the language. And some of the pronunciation, the sisters always say, I'm, I'm much better at saying some letters that a lot of Americans are unable to say in Malayalam. But I think it's because of that other language practice along the way. So God gave me that exposure and that help. And we do have our sisters, speaking of it being Missionary Sunday, uh, we have our sisters, we have two new missions that CMC has begun. We have missions in Peru where they speak Spanish. So we have sisters learning Spanish there. And we also have our mission in Iraq, which we're especially sponsoring during this Missionary Sunday. And uh, our sisters are also learning like Arabic and Kurdish and other languages there. And in India, India itself offers so much area to, to evangelize and to bring the gospel message. I learned a little Hindi. I had seen in the chat, someone asked, what does Bhopal mean province? Like, so when you're in a congregation, um, you have a superior general, like over the top of everyone. Our superior general is Mother CB. Uh, but then you also have provinces to help to organize the sisters because we have more than 6,000 sisters around the world. So if all of us went to Mother CB with our questions, she'd have a much busier life than she does even now. Uh, so you have kind of layers of local superiors, regional superiors, provinces, and their superiors to help organize and guide the whole congregation. Uh, so that's what that means. But when I went there, that's in Madhya Pradesh in India. So I learned a little Hindi. So I could learn, um, my Hindi is terrible though. I learned Jai Yeshu, Meranam, Diana He. At the time I was saying, Mehek CMC Navis Hum, but now I'm CMC sister. Uh, wow. So I learned a little Hindi along the way as well. Um, so, so many areas for language development. That's great. Okay, that's awesome. You've traveled so much and who knows if the Lord brings you to uh, to South America to a Spanish-speaking country? I wouldn't be surprised if the Lord did that, given the um, the Spanish gift that He has given you. So, who knows? That'd be awesome. Good. Does anyone have any? And I and I did see. Sorry, Sorry I did see. I think someone sent a, a question to me directly, so I don't know if you can see that message. But one person wrote, "What would you say God's purpose is for you to join CMC?" That was the same person who asked about the Bhopal Province. So I would say that that's a question I got a lot, um, even from actually from other Americans. <laughs> they would ask, why are you joining CMC? Why that congregation? Like why an Indian congregation and not an American congregation? But I think God has a purpose for me. More and more, I'm, I'm more convinced of that. And I think it's very timely that he's calling me here at the same time that he's calling people like Father Kevin and Father Melvin, who just got ordained. So people... Um, who were born and brought up in the U.S., although from Malayali background, he's calling them also to the priesthood and religious life in different ways. So I think God is setting a framework for the future of the, the Syro Malabar church here in this, in this country and what that future will look like. And I feel like God has some plan for me along with that too. I'm, I'm not sure what it will be yet, but I know he's, he's working through me in different ways and different experiences. So I'm very grateful to Father Kevin for this opportunity. I, when I was getting ready for this interview, I was just praying. I'm like, God, whatever you want me to say, just, to, just you say it for me because I'm very poor in planning for these things. Yeah, the Holy Spirit was moving and was among you. And so you did a beautiful job. Thank you so much, sister. I don't know if anyone else is asking any more questions directly to you, but feel free to answer them if you would like. Um, I have no question. Ah, yes, I see another one. Um, oh, this was, uh, what are the charisms of your congregation, uh, they wrote. So that's a very good question. So each congregation ha has a charism, like a particular emphasis or a focus on what we do. And I like our charism very much. It, it has a long form and a short form. The longer form is, is like our charism is personal sanctification and the redemptive uplift of the people of God. The short form, which is the one I always share with people, is to be holy and to lead others to holiness. And I feel like that's really where you get our active Carmelite uh, spirituality that you have be holy. Like, how do we do that? Through our prayer life, through our sacramental life, through our, our encounter with God and lead others to holiness which is what we do in our apostolic activities. So in our teaching, working in the health ministry, working in pastoral ministry, 
um, in the social work field, our sisters, especially in India, have so many different ministries they're engaged in. So all of those areas allow us to, to expose people to the gospel message and to encourage them to become saints. That's what St. Chavra wanted. He was like, why is India? We, we were evangelized by St. Thomas the Apostle. Why don't we have more Indian saints from our own soil? So we want to, to make more saints and lead other people to holiness and encourage them to live lives dedicated to God in that way. That's awesome. I'm sure that questioning led him to, to want to be a saint as well. And so here he is now, a canonized saint. So that's really cool. <laughs> yes. Good. Um, are there any more questions on your side? Otherwise, we can conclude. And um, yeah. Oh. Uh. Do you want me to answer this one? What do you think inhibits women from joining the religious life? Sure, go for it. Um, so I would say that's that's a good question, and I think it can come from a few different areas. Sometimes it's the the influence of the culture around us. There's a lot of uh, doubts or confusions about the church or about religious life or what you're doing in religious life, especially nowadays when we have uh, children that are not as many in, in families there's not as many big families so it can be hard for parents even as well to encourage their children to pursue a vocation to religious life and i think it's that worry i would say in our, our culture people are very worried about making the wrong choice or the wrong decision so then they can delay for a long time kind of responding to that call uh, so I would say those can be some of the influences that would inhibit somebody maybe from responding to that call to religious life. And to respond to that, we, we just have to have that prayer life and, and the courage to try it out, just to see if this is what God is calling me to and, and not to be afraid of making a mistake, because there's no mistakes uh, in, in God's plan, even if it's not ultimately religious life he's calling you to. That experience of discernment will give you tools and resources and develop that relationship with God that can sustain you so much into the future as well. That was a beautiful answer. Um, yeah, the culture, I guess, it's not very typical for a girl to think about this. Even our own Catholic circles, I think many of us grew up without seeing sisters. Um, and so for someone to want to become a sister and to dedicate her life completely to God and to make that decision, and you did highlight the fact that we have difficulty making decisions, right? Um, it's very tough to make a commitment in our culture, right? We always want that kind of leeway to kind of like escape in case things don't work out, whatever. Um, but, um, but God will lead, lead us to where he wants us to be and we have to trust in him. So what our Lord wants is what he asks us to, to walk by faith and not by sight and to, to continue to, to trust. Definitely, Father, that was very beautiful. Trust we need so much. Good. Awesome. So if there's no more questions, uh, we will just conclude uh, with a blessing. Um, so in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for this spiritful time you've given us. We thank you for the gift of your daughter, Sister Deanna Therese. We ask you to continue to bless her in her ministry as her sister within her convent, within her entire congregation. We especially pray for all those who joined this call been listening to you speaking through her. We ask you, Lord, to inspire the hearts of many young people to give themselves to you, to respond to your call, and to serve you in whatever way you ask them to. Bless our families, bless all of our young people, and help us, O oh Lord, to ultimately desire heaven. And Mother Mary, we ask you to pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now, always, and forever. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sister Deanna, and thank you to all of our guests who have joined us for this call. And so may God bless you all. Happy Mission Sunday, and may we all respond mm -hmm. to our call as baptized Christians to preach the good news to all those we encounter. So have a good Sunday and uh, God bless you. Stay tuned for our next episode, which is in November. So looking forward to that. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Father. Thank you so much, sister. So God bless you. Take care and good night, everyone.